Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's, today's presentation, Keeping Your Lungs Healthy, is presented by Heather Heath and Deborah Christ, Respiratory Care Practitioners with Washington Hospital Healthcare System. Thank you, Christy, for a great introduction. Good evening and welcome to our presentation on Keeping Your Lungs Healthy. Deborah Christ and I our respiratory therapist staffed here at Washington Hospital, and we have a combined of over 50 years of respiratory care experience. Over the next 30 minutes, Deborah and I hope to give you some practical and useful ideas for everyday life that can improve your breathing and protect your lungs. Our objectives tonight is a brief anatomy lesson on how your lungs function. We will then explain a few factors that may influence your breathing in an outdoor and indoor setting, and how to locate the air quality counts to determine how safe it is for you and your family. And finally, we will provide some self-management tools and tips to protect and empower yourselves. And at the end of our presentation, we will have a few minutes for some of your questions. So why do the lungs matter? I'm going to jump right in and tell you why they matter, because breathing is essential to life. And most of us take it for granted. I'm going to give you a real quick example that if you smash your finger in a door, you're going to take some really shallow breaths. That's not as good as if you take a really large breath. So we want you to stay calm and relaxed and take those full breaths. These breaths are essential to life. And without it, our tissues, our organs, and our brain are not able to function as much as we can properly. So I want to give you a real quick thing in regards to your breathing mechanics that we have done. There are three factors um, that need to happen for your breathing. And the very first one, it starts with your nose. Your nose is the first line of defense and it filters the large particles and warms the air before it reaches your lungs. If you ever had that tickling sensation in your nose, that is from hair-like fibers that are capturing all of these particles and making you itch. So blowing your nose, sneezing and coughing, spread these particles back into the air and this is how other people get sick. The second portion is your diaphragm. As you see in this diagram, there's a muscle that is moving up and down. When the breathing or inhalation happens, that diaphragm needs to lower to allow the lungs to fully expand. The second part, uh, that is the second part, excuse me, and the third part is the exhalation part, and that is the act of breathing out. And when you breathe out, you're getting rid of the carbon dioxide that is inside of your lungs. So this is a very, very important tool, a very, very important mechanism that your body needs to go through in order to have nice, healthy lungs. The next portion of this is going to be when your lungs are filled with those particles, how this is occurring with the outside environment. And I'm going to have Deborah come in and show you how that all works. Deborah? Hello. So. The air we breathe is the one absolute thing that we all have in common, and we are 100% dependent on that air. Most of us don't consider the air quality when we go outside, but there are risks, and that is magnified for people with health, con uh, health concerns or challenges. Even if the air isn't orange, like we have seen with the recent fires, the quality of the air may be compromised and contribute to long-term health effects. If you have the burden of a pre-existing heart or lung disease like COPD or asthma, and that is for all age groups, 
poor air quality is going to impact you sooner and probably worse than somebody without disease. These groups are susceptible to subtle changes in our air quality. With or without a health condition, there are tools available that could be used as a guide when deciding on outdoor exercise or activities that can be healthier choices for your lungs. It's my hope to give you an overview on the importance of air quality, what to look for, and how that impacts us all. So particles and pollutants. The term particulate matter, I'll abbreviate that as PM, or particle pollution is going to be helpful in understanding our air quality. For, day, for today's talk, it is the term used when referring to the debris or pollution that is floating through the air and ultimately what we are breathing. Particulate matter is made up of tiny pieces of solids or liquids known as aerosols and those um, are suspended in the air. There are different types of particle matter, but they all take up space, have mass, and can be measured. That unit of measurement is called a micron or micrometer. That is one twenty-five thousandths of an inch. Anything 10 microns or less is considered inhalable. We will call those coarse particles, or PM10, because they are 10 microns. Some examples of coarse particles are dirt, dust, powders, smoke, and sand. These are considered large or macroscopic because we can generally see them with our eyes, or at least the shadows of them. Some examples of particles that are microscopic or so small that you cannot see them with the naked eye are combustion particles, metals, gases, and some components of smoke. These are considered fine particles, or PM 2.5. And to give you a scope, even a single hair is measured in microns. A single human hair is 50 to 70 microns. And this slide kind of shows you the compar comparison between those. Where do those particles end up when we breathe them? Now, you know that a particle that measures 10 microns can be inhaled. Fortunately, our noses, through that filtering and moistening system that Heather was talking about, th that prevents the largest of the particles from reaching our lungs. However, the smallest of those particles, those in the less than five micron group, can reach the smallest of airways and potentially, because they are so small, they may transfer to our bloodstream through our lungs. Those are considered the ultrafine particles and measure 0.1 micron. Most of the reduced vis visibility, or haze, or smog as we know it, in the sky is from fine particles. As respiratory therapists, our best and most effective nebulizers deliver medication in the 2.5 micron range. So there are resources, and one of those is the Air Now app, and that's from the EPA, um, uh, that help us keep track of air quality. One of those resources, like I was saying, the Air Now app uh, is from the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. It's available online at airnow.gov, or to go down, or to download for free of charge onto your smartphone. It provides a simple and quick way to check the current air quality and weekly forecast for daily planning. Each day provides a color-coded meter of the current air quality and it's updated hourly. Each color band represents varying degrees of particle pollution. By entering your local city and state or zip code, you can have a readily available air quality assessment. The AirNow app is a good resource of information and is recommended by our pulmonary rehab team here at the hospital. I'm going to talk about air quality index. The term air quality index or AQI is the term used to define the amount of particulate matter or particulate pollution. The lower the number on the scale, the safer it is to breathe. The scale ranges from 0 to 500 microns and levels rarely exceed 200 in the United States due to local and federal policies that are in place. A value of 0 to 50 microns is represented by the green section and is an indicator of good air quality. 
The yellow section represents particles of 50 to 100 microns and is considered to be moderate risk. And remember the first scale that that hair was 50 to 70 microns. This range is generally safe for most people, but may be an alert for some people with pre-existing conditions. As the scale progresses from orange into the red and then red into purple, the amount of particle pollution increases to the point of being very unhealthy, especially for the sensitive groups. At this level, children, asthmatics, and people with heart or lung conditions should avoid the outdoors and everyone should reduce outside activities. The maroon scale is from 301 to 500 and is considered hazardous to your health. It's an emergency condition alert and it is recommended that you stay indoors with the windows and doors closed. The app offers the option to add other locations for quick reference as well. You can add out of the area locations of family and friends, or if you are in a sensitive group, it can be useful for planning day trips. This is a screenshot of my phone. My sister and her family live in Valley Springs in Calaveras County. By pressing the smoke button in the right lower hand corner, you will be able to see an air quality and fire map, which is what's displayed here. This feature allowed me to see how close a fire was uh, this past summer to her and her family and to keep track of the air quality in her area. This is a picture of the Caldor wildfire in Dorado County in Northern California that started on a, uh, August 18th, 2021 on the California-Nevada border. And if you look close, if you're on a big enough screen, you'll be able to see there is a firefighter um, fighting that. It's kind of hard to see if you're on your phone, but it's kind of impressive. This grew to nearly 222,000 acres or 347 square miles before the U.S. Forest Service claimed 100% containment two months later on August or October 21st, excuse me. The wind was a huge factor, and if it not only accelerated the flames, but it also carried smoke and debris as far east as Denver and Salt Lake City, as far south as Visalia, California, and north into Oregon within the first week. The media area around Lake Tahoe and Truckee had an AQI of 301 to 500, which is that maroon color in the hazardous range. The wind continued to carry and fan out the smoke, affecting our air quality locally in Fremont by August 26, where we stayed in the yellow zone or moderate range for one day before entering the orange zone, and that's the 101 to 150 microns, and unhealthy for sensitive groups. I'm sure you can recall that the sky was hazy orange and you can smell the smoke. Tracy and Modesto by this time reached the unhealthy red zone, 151 to 200. Fremont finally was considered back in the green on September 9th, six weeks after the fire had started in mid-August. Wildfire smoke is made up of many elements such as gases and water vapor, but the most dangerous among them is particulate matter measuring in the 2.5 micron range and less. The smaller fine particles, called ultrafine particles, are particularly, uh, are particularly hazard airborne pollutant because of the health risk. These ultrafine particles, smaller than 1, 0 0.1 micron, are the most dangerous because of their small size. When inhaled, the particles can easily cross over from the lungs to the bloodstream and then to other regions of the body. This is particularly hard on people who are already burdened with chronic heart and lung disease. We saw more patients admitted with shortness of breath during this time. Some possible reactions that we might have to irritants from smoke and pollution are the rapid heartbeat, fatigue, if you're an asthmatic, it could ca cause wheezing. People suffer from headaches, chest pain, increased shortness of breath, stinging watery eyes, a scratchy throat, irritated sinuses, and coughing. Again, these are all magnified when you're burdened with a pre-existing condition. 
There is the potential for carbon monoxide poisoning as well, depending on how close you are um, to the fire and the air quality. Symptoms for carbon, uh, or CO, carbon monoxide poisoning, include headache, dizziness, weakness, upset stomach, vomiting, chest pain, confusion, loss of co uh, consciousness followed by coma and death. Hopefully you have an escape plan in place if you are in a high risk area. The takeaway from all of this, monitor your air quality and pollutants in your neighborhood with online resources or an app, curtail outdoor activity, close the doors and windows on days with poor air quality. With the doors closed, use an air purifier for wildfire smoke to help clean the inside air and filter particles when and if they enter the home. Wear a mask if outdoor activity is essential, particularly on days in that yellow or orange zone. And if you want more information, you can find volumes at airnow.gov, epa.gov, and the American Lung Association also has articles on the state of the air. Now, let's take this indoors with Heather. Wow, that's incredible information and extremely helpful. Thank you. I think I really need to go and download that app tonight. I too myself need to get it. So how about different areas of your home? Air quality in the home also plays an important role on your breathing. Regardless of your location, particulate matter continues to make a difference in your lung health. Particles travel through those vents, escape from doors, and move throughout the home. Being inside is known as an enclosed environment, whereas being on the outside, there's a lot of flow that goes on, and it is continuous. It's best to ventilate your home inside by opening your windows whenever possible, and when the AQI that Debbie was describing is safe outdoors. Checking the AQI is very, very in, uh, beneficial and to know when your lungs are getting the best quality of air. So I have a couple of indoor pollutants that are very common, especially during the holiday season. We all like to have the candles and the, a lot of cooking going on. It's cold outside, so the fireplaces are there, and our children are doing all kinds of hobbies. But indoor pollutants are particles that are found inside the home. And these include particles that are from the outside. These particles migrate indoors, so we do need to be careful with that. They also generate, through our cooking, any combustive activities, such as the burning of the candles. And believe it or not, those hobbies, you might need to make sure your windows and doors are open and wear a jacket. Other particles can also be from different cells that are released into the air. Those cells could be things like animal dander, uh, cat saliva, dust, pollen, bacteria, and even cockroaches have been known to, to move those things around. And then your stoves and heaters, your fireplaces and chimneys, and how about the smoking? I know that's a really tough one and it's a really hard subject. But when it's trapped inside, you're affecting everybody in the household. So I have a question for you. Did you know that there are over 4,000 noxious chemicals found in a cigarette alone? That is a lot, and that needs to be eliminated. Or have you heard about third-hand smoking? This is the particles that linger on surfaces and that are floating in the air. And you can really smell it. The smell is real. As respiratory therapists, we witness on a daily basis individuals coming in with shortness of breath. And the first question we ask is, are you still smoking? A lot of them will say, oh, I just quit, or I quit some time ago. But we still smell the smoke, and we still smell everything that's going on. They may be truthful, but it's that third-hand smoke that we are smelling. So we reviewed different indoor pollutants. So how do we improve from here? First, stove hoods are incredibly important. They remove odors, particles, and fumes from indoors to outside. To check these, try to set a reminder every three months. You can do this by putting it on your smartphone or on your calendar. 
I still am old school, which means I write everything down. It's always to be safe and check than to wonder if you've done it or not. You can invest in an air filter, which I will discuss with you a little bit later down the road. You can have some moist disposable towels available to wipe down items that are dusty. I really love my wet mop. Um, it's very terrific. And uh, I invested in one of those to make sure my floors are always clean and dust free. If you have a vacuum, go ahead and use it on a regular basis, but remember to change your filters in there or to clean the inner canister if you have one where the dust and all the uh, dirt uh, leaves. Um, I understand that it's very difficult for some of you to quit smoking, but I have seen way too many people come in with difficulty and end up on machines that I really don't want to have them on. Um, and it all is caused because they have had a hard time with quitting to smoke and their lungs are being affected with it. If you've tried and have not been as successful, continue trying because there are resources available for you. So most of the individuals that I talk to when they're in the hospital is the air purifiers versus humidifiers. To make it very simple, air purifiers remove contaminants from the air to improve the indoor air quality. They draw air through fabric filters and these filters capture the floating particles that we've been discussing throughout this presentation. When you have an air purifier, you want to place it in an airflow movement, which means don't close all your windows and doors and expect it to work. You actually have to have some form of a flow. Whereas a humidifier is a device that actually increases the humidity in your room, and this could be very dangerous. <clears throat> Excuse me. It creates spores that are inhaled and or drop on items creating a very damp environment. If this moisture is heated, this is much worse because those spores, they multiply very, very quickly. This is where mildew and mold are visual. Dust mites and bacteria are also produced, but you won't be able to see them as readily. So choosing the correct purifier for your home and your inside environment, this can be researched through the websites or through the web um, and you can pick which one's best for you. But if you're going to pick one, pick an air purifier because humidifiers, they are going to cause nothing but problems with mold. Now I'm going to show you these pictures. Um, these were taken. Um, this is what mold looks like. If you look where the arrows are, it almost looks like a dirty panel. Um, this is mold. And this is the worst kind of mold called black mold. This was found near a pipe, as you can see there. And what happened, it was located when a floor tile was lifting and the adjoining wallpaper had started to peel. As they investigated further, they noticed that this was spreading and the pipe had been leaking. So what you should know about mold, it is a fungus. And it has myto, uh, mycotoxin spores that are released into the air. They are tiny enough that we cannot see them, but they do smell. So how do you know if it's mold? Well, mold smells musty like mud. It loves a dark and moist environment, and it spreads like wildfire. So some things you should think about. If you're not sure if it's mold and you think it's dirt, just keep this in mind. Mold spreads, dirt and stains remain the same. So once you found out that this is mold, it enters into your body and it creates different reactions, such as an allergic reaction. And some of those would be sneezing, a runny nose, red eyes. You can get a uh, rash on your skin and you can become very short of breath. Or mold can also worsen chronic conditions, such as asthma, interstitial lung disease, hypersensitivity, and sinus infections. So how do you clean this up? Well, the first step is you want to keep your windows and doors opened while you're using products with strong odors. Because remember those particles, you are inhaling them. Use a fan to blow in one direction 
while using products, and this will limit the inhalation of product into your lungs. Be careful not to mix products. The two products that are deadly is bleach and ammonia. And the reason why is because it releases a toxic cholamine gas. And always keep your cleaning products in a secure and designated area, especially where children and pets are not around. And most importantly, we encourage you to choose products that have minimal smells and that are good for our environment. These products should be thrown away in the appropriate receptacles. Do not leave any behind for anybody to ingest or smell from a canister. So let's consider the ways to be active and healthy breathers. And Deborah has some ways that can empower yourself and educate those around you to do the same. Here's Debbie. Back again. Okay, thank you, Heather, for the insight on the inside. So I like this quote. In 1736, Benjamin Franklin coined the phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It was originally written to the citizens of Philadelphia to remain vigilant about fire awareness and prevention. And while that original meaning is certainly still pertinent today, the phrase is now associated with taking precautions as a whole. Taking precautions and being proactive through personally responsible choices can protect our lungs. Being uh, proactive and making, oops, I said that already. So, um, making this, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth far more than a pound if it prevents a hospitalization. Stay mindful and make strong choices that benefit you, your family, and friends by preventing the spread of illness. So one of those protective strategies is hand washing, and it's the number one way to prevent the spread of disease. So just as a refresher, use soap and water for visibly soiled hands, rubbing them together for 20 seconds, and remembering to wash your nails, your knuckles, and between your fingers. The happy birthday song, or to say your ABCs, is about the length of time that it should take before rinsing. The major majority of the time, a 60% alcohol-based gel can be used. Then rub your hands together until they're dry. These next couple slides are compliments of my son, so I'm having a proud mama moment. So. This one is on how to wear a mask. And when it comes to masks and vaccinations, we clearly are all doing a pretty darn good job. It's encouraging that the hospital COVID numbers have really dropped. So keep up the good work and be careful because the holidays are coming and we will be gathering. I know we have been instructed to death on masks, but I want to give you just a really brief review to keep the information fresh in our minds. When choosing a mask, look for one that is at least two layers of washable, breathable fabric or is disposable and can be discarded at the end of your day or when soiled. It's helpful to know if you hold, hold it up to the light that you should not see any light come through the fabric. Look for a mask with a bendable nose piece that can be molded over the bridge of your nose. And for people who wear glasses, this will help prevent fogging. When the mask is on, it should fit snugly against your face without gaps. And this is true for children over two as well. The mask should not become dislodged when you are talking, exposing your chin or your nose because then you feel like you have to reach up to reposition it and you should not be touching the mask after it's in place. For people with facial hair, trimming your beard will improve the fit but you can use a mask fitter or brace to hold it in place. Another option may be to use a disposable mask underneath a cloth mask. When you remove your mask, remember this fabric has been collecting particles, yours and others, all day, so make sure it ends up in the garbage can or the laundry, then wash your hands. Diseases like the coronavirus, the flu, and tuberculosis, to name a few, can spread through droplets and particles that are released into the air by speaking, singing, coughing, or sneezing. This graphic gives you a visual on the density and distance of particles transmitted between two people with and without a mask while talking. 
You have no idea what you may be sharing with others. So the best case scenario is clearly with each person wearing a mask where transmission is in the least. And just a reminder, when you sneeze, if you do not have a tissue, make sure it is directed into your elbow and not your bare hands. Wearing a mask is still required here at the hospital because of the number of high-risk people. These include people over 65, people living with heart disease, diabetes, obesity, chronic lung disease, and people who are immunocompromised, such as cancer patients on chemotherapy. So a good way to remember these things is by thinking the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. So some proactive choices that you can make to prevent illness and keep your lungs healthy in addition to those three W's would be to seek help if you are not able to quit smoking on your own. There's no shame in that. It's hard, but it's doable. Try to live a healthy lifestyle by getting lots of rest, eating healthy, stay hydrated, exercise on a regular basis, and try to achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Make appointments for routine physicals and when you're not feeling well. Keep your vaccinations up to date. Discuss with your doctors which ones are best for you. The flu, pneumonia, shingles, COVID. That discussion is for you and your doctor to decide. If you suffer from lung disease, become familiar with what triggers a breathing problem so you can avoid it. For some, that may be a sodium in your diet. For others, it may be when pine trees release pollen. Take your medication how it is prescribed for you. Monitor expiration dates and quantities frequently. How many pills do I have left? How many puffs are left in my inhaler? Contact your doctor early in the week for refills. You don't wanna run out of your inhalers or your kids' inhalers on a Friday night after the doctor's office has closed for the weekend. Each of these things can impact your breathing and lung health in different ways but these are all things that you can control. So let's go back a few slides and Ben Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's gonna be the most empowering physical thing that you can do for yourself. Please stay safe, plan ahead, use prevention to protect yourself and keep those lungs healthy. Heather's now going to wrap this up with a few last words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. All right. So I know that Debbie or Deborah was talking about the, the smoking aspect of it. Believe me, smoking, it's not attractive for sure. And the last thing I wanna see is someone suffering to take a breath. And in my profession as a respiratory therapist, I see it every day. So I wanna give you a little scenario. This is coming from a smoking perspective. You took a cigarette and you smoked it. You became really short of breath because you started to cough. You decided, well, you know what? I've checked my medication. I think I'm gonna give myself a breathing treatment. But this isn't doing the job. This is not working so well. So you start to panic and you call 911. They arrive, whistles and bells, and they decide to come in and see you. You're still short of breath, they check everything and they decide you need to go on oxygen or furthermore, you need to go on a machine to help push your air into the lungs. They rush you to the hospital. Now you're even more scared and you still can't breathe. So we do everything that we can in respiratory therapy to the point where it becomes so difficult that we need to put you on a different machine called a ventilator. So you're on a ventilator, you have no idea how many days have gone by, but your breathing has improved. We decide to take the tube out and you go home. If you don't stop smoking, the cycle starts all over again. And we don't wanna see you for that reason. We wanna see you outside. Is it really worth it? The time that you take away from your home and the money you spent on smoking and that hospital stay, I don't think it's really that worth it. I really don't. I understand that smoking is considered an addiction. Smoking often begins with someone that you are familiar and comfortable being around. Or you can be like me, a child of somebody who had smoking all the time. My father smoked 
up until he was about 79 or 80. And going to the bowling alleys, living here in Fremont, and here in the hospitals, smoking was the norm. It's just what people did back then, is what I was always told. And the famous people do it, and it's super glamorous, so I think I want to pick it up. As you see, this is a camel's um, advertisement that I found online. And it does look pretty glamorous in there, but it's really not. So try to quit smoking. The other thing I want to bring up is now and today is the vaping and also water pipes. Now, some people say that they are going to do these two items to quit smoking, but some things to consider. These are man-made products. They're synthetic, and they are not pure air that are entering into your lungs. These are particles, and they do float in the air, and they drop on surfaces. So bottom line is, if you're doing anything other than breathing in the air, just quit altogether. Please do us a favor. Do yourselves a favor. In order to help you with that, Washington Hospital has a Better Breathers for Life Club that meets here once a month. It also, uh, starting in January, they are gonna do both live, where you can come here, and also on Zoom. The person in charge of that is Sherry Harrington. She is in charge of all of our pulmonary rehab and Better Breathers for Life Club. And what's great, it's free. So please contact Sherry Harrington for more information on how you can be part of the Better Breathers for Life Club. And then to wrap things up here, we also at the Washington Hospital have a pulmonary rehab uh, program. And this program does need to have a physician's order. You have to do a test to see if you are qualified for this program. And they meet twice a week for six weeks on a one-on-one -on -one education piece with a qualified pulmonary rehab staff member. These two programs are super beneficial. They're helpful and we encourage you to do them. The feedback that those have taken um, and they have attended, they're extremely positive and they have built lasting friendships throughout this program. Our hope is that you found this presentation helpful and informative, and thank you for tuning in tonight. Both Deborah and I are open for a few questions you may have about keeping your lungs healthy. Stay healthy and encouraged. Great, thank you, Heather. We, have, we do have a few questions. Sure. The first question is, if I have COVID and I'm not hospitalized, only quarantined at home, what would be the best way to keep my lungs healthy as possible? I can answer that. Do we need to trade? Yep. Stay here. All right. Unfortunately, with COVID, once you have it, there isn't a way to prevent your lungs from uh, getting worse. It, that's what the virus does. It attacks your lungs. And um, if you have it and you start developing the shortness of breath, we do something called proning here at the hospital, and that is when you're laying face down, that does improve the shortness of breath. And maybe this is a good, good place, since the holidays are coming, to go over the symptoms of COVID. So you're gonna get headache, fever, chills, upper respiratory symptoms like runny nose, sore throat, you could have muscle uh, aches, um, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. It could cause diarrhea, vomiting. So you get a whole list of things. But if you're home quarantined with COVID, there's, not, no, uh, there's no specific way to keep it from reaching your lungs because that's what the virus does. It attacks your lungs. Once you have it, you just have to monitor your symptoms. Thank you. Um, how important is it uh, to have an exhaust fan in your kitchen? I can answer that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking. The exhaust fan inside of your kitchen or above your, uh, your stove is extremely, extremely, extremely important. I cannot stress that enough. There is a lot of cooking that happen, happens there, and there is oils 
and different fumes that are emanating through that. Um, some of those things that are emanating through that air um, are things that are very dangerous. Um, that's where carbon dioxide actually um, is built, or monoxide. Um, you can have um, anything from nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, anything that you are cooking, remember that it changes molecular. So that means that it starts off in one way, and then when the heat hits it, it changes that cell. So you want all those fumes that are coming up into the kitchen to be eliminated. So that exhaust fan is extremely important. It's good to know, but what if I don't have an exhaust fan? Would an air purifier work just as well? An air purifier, it's a little bit different because air purifiers, they actually need flow. So you need to actually have the flow from something to get it to go through a filter and then out. When you're cooking on a stovetop, there is no airflow in there and it has no way of escaping. So to have an air purifier there is not gonna do any good at all. Okay, good information. We have one last question. During the winter, we use a wood-burning stove every night. Is this hazardous to my lungs? I'll take that one. Thank you, that's a great question and it reminds me of growing up. We had a, a fireplace insert at our home that we used to heat the house. And from what I remember about that is a lot of burning sinuses and watery eyes. Um, that was a lot of years ago, but uh, just think of it as, it's like a, far, a forest fire in your fireplace. It's enclosed, but it, it still is a problem. So regulations have changed, and the best thing to do is to make sure that it's EPA certified, um, that controls the emission, um, from the stove itself. If you have the option, if you haven't bought it yet, and you um, have the option of pellets, pellets are, are really clean burning and will have a low emission. So those are my, my recommendations. Well, those are great recommendations, thank you. So this concludes our program. Thank you, Deborah and Heather, for this insightful presentation. And thank you, viewers, for, tu for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's event will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube.